Hello everybody, welcome to Blue Marble Science. Sleeping warrior thinks an accelerometer weighs things. <laughs> I wonder why he thinks they call that pedal in his minivan an accelerator. Apparently, Sleeping Warrior didn't care much for my recent video using the accelerometer in my cell phone to demonstrate gravity, so he decided to debunk it. Now, that was the moment when things started to go tragically wrong for him. I want you to listen as Anthony proves he knows even less about a cell phone than he does about a $10 dissolved solids meter. Hey, Gladys, are you ready? Let's light this dumpster fire and have a lot of fun. The first thing Sleeping Warrior is going to do is omit the first part of my demonstration that clearly showed that if the phone's XY reference frame was perpendicular to gravity, centripetal acceleration was the only acceleration acting on the accelerometer. But that changes as soon as the reference frame is changed. So I want you to get ready for some stupidity of biblical proportions as Anthony tries to explain how accelerometers weigh things. Warning. Oven mitts are required for this one. No exceptions. Hello everybody. It's sad to have to bring this to your attention. But I want to raise awareness to this pseudoscientist that's preaching scientific method and claiming that he's demonstrating the acceleration of gravity. On the face of it, what appears to be a credible attempt at trying to demonstrate something that he believes he sees. This guy is fundamentally failing at science, and he doesn't accept any criticisms whatsoever, because he thinks that in some way they're personal, and therefore he can dismiss them. What I'm about to present to you is the problems with this um, so-called experiment, or demonstration, and show you the reasons for why, and I'll let you, the viewer, make your own mind up as to whether or not you feel that my points are valid against this test, and whether or not the guy that's done this test should be doing something to address them or not. In this test, what he's basically doing is using his accelerometer in his phone to, and I quote, demonstrate the acceleration of gravity. So I'll play the small clip where he now does it, and basically, this is on the face of it credible. I mean, it's, it makes sense. I get what he's trying to do. He's trying to put the phone in a rotating reference frame and demonstrate the effect of gravity. Problem is, his phone's got mass to it. it. It has a weight. And when I say weight, I mean it in its colloquial sense. It has weight. I don't mean it with little g mathematically. I mean it in real world. And he's got the graph now. So I'm going to pause it at this point. Let's just get rid of the reflection. And we can see what's happening here is the weight of the phone is being represented by the size of the um, amplitude of the wave. And obviously the weight of the phone goes with the rotation of the, the, sorry, the rotation goes with the weight of the phone one way, and then it goes against the rotation of the phone the other way. So it's that's why it's going above and below the, um, the, the zero line. The phone's always got a, a weight, and sometimes it goes with it, and sometimes it goes with against the weight of the phone. And that's what we're looking at. No, that is not what you're looking at. You're looking at the output from the MEMS accelerometer in the cell phone. It measures acceleration. It doesn't measure weight. It doesn't measure mass or temperature or pressure or density or anything else. Just acceleration. That is the only thing it possibly can measure. Watch this. Have you ever wondered how your phone manages to know what direction you're holding it? It's using a device called an accelerometer. It works by sensing the acceleration of gravity, and then you can calculate what direction the phone is facing. But how does a piece of electronics sense something mechanical like acceleration? The answer is MEMS, Microelectromechanical Systems. MEMS are kind of like silicon integrated circuits, but they're mechanical in nature. MEMS manufacturers use similar techniques that are used to make electronics, but instead they're making tiny mechanical structures that can interface to electronics, allowing you to build some interesting things. Here I've got some MEMS dies that I made out of silicon. They contain a lot of the same basic structures that you might find in a modern MEMS chip. 
Let's take a look under the microscope. This is a tiny resistor. The lighter colored material is actually electrically conductive silicon, and this darker area that's been etched away doesn't conduct. This long winding electrical path forms a resistor, very similar to how a long piece of wire would also have a significant resistance. So if you made an electrical connection between these two points, you'd have a microscopic resistor. Now, in order to understand how an accelerometer works, let's look at a MEMS capacitor. It doesn't look much like a capacitor, does it? Well, remember that all a capacitor really is, is two conductive plates that are electrically separated. Here are the two terminals of the capacitor. Over here, we have what's called a combed finger arrangement. The two structures are very close to each other, but they aren't quite touching. Let me highlight it for you. Now it should be more obvious that you have parallel surfaces which form a capacitor. But this is no ordinary capacitor. It's a physical structure that can move. This thing over here is basically a tiny weight made out of silicon, and it's kind of like a suspended mass on the end of a spring. Movement, vibrations, and even gravity can cause this little mass to move around, and when it does, it shifts the entire combed finger structure. When the fingers move, the distance between the fingers changes. And when the distance between the fingers changes, you get a change in capacitance. So now we have an electromechanical system that can sense movement and turn it into a changing capacitance value. The next step would be to design circuitry that can sense the change in capacitance and convert it into useful voltages or serial data, but that's beyond the scope of this tutorial. Well, this is what you saw in the video, or at least what you would have seen if Sleeping Warrior would have played the entire video, but he didn't. Uh, when we had the uh, accelerometer rotating in a horizontal plane, uh, in a circle like that. These are the velocity vectors represented by the V at each end. These are the uh, centripetal accelerations, A sub C, there and there. And as you can see, the velocity vectors just rotate around and around and around. And that is the, that's why we have this, this centripetal force. This force is what is pulling that vector around in a circle. Now the result, the green trace here is the centripetal acceleration. And if I would have held the, uh, the speed constant, which I didn't do a very good job of it, but if I would have held that speed a little more constant, that's just ba basically a straight line showing that constant centripetal acceleration. The red line is the velocity. That's the uh, x-axis, not the y-axis. And you can see where it starts right here. You get uh, the starting acceleration. Then it goes to zero because it's constant speed, more or less. And then you see the deceleration at the other end of it. Now that is with it rotating so, so that gravity is straight down into the screen as we're looking at it right now. On the other hand, when we turn it around uh, sideways, where the gravity vector is now up and down in the page, like that. We still have our velocity vectors and our centripetal acceleration vectors. I'm only going to consider these two points just because it makes it a lot easier to draw it. But here's the deal. Here are the gravity vectors across here. Here are the gravity vectors on the bottom half of the circle across there. There are the centripetal acceleration vectors. Top half of the circle, bottom half of the circle. On the top half, the, the uh, centripetal acceleration vector adds to the gravity vector, and the resultant is that little red dot right there. On the bottom, the gravity vector subtracts from the, from the centripetal acceleration vector, and you get that little red dot right there. What happens when you connect the dots? Well, you get that, you get that, and you get this, the same thing. But you get something else that's interesting. You get the, uh, now you see uh, the velocity vector, which should have, which is constant. We showed it over here. And the only thing we did was turn the rig around sideways. It's a straight line there. Here, 
it's the same picture that you've got there except displaced by 90 degrees those peaks don't line up this is just a, right here is just a blow up of this section over in here so that is a very adequate demonstration of the effect of gravitational acceleration that is not the weight of the damn phone that is what the accelerometers were measuring. Well, since we've already gone through routine, stupid, why not double down and see what other kind of uh, crazy crap we can come up with? The problem is, we know by Cavendish's experiment that when Cavendish quantified the effects of gravity, he demonstrated, or he quantified it to be a 50 millionth of the object's weight. You got that from this Wikipedia page, Anthony. And that's not what it says. It does not say gravity is one fifty millionth of the weight of my telephone. And saying that is being either stupid or dishonest or both. What it says specifically is the force involved in twisting the torsion balance was very small. About one fifty millionth of the weight of the small balls. That's what it says specifically. How about we don't rep misrepresent this anymore? Newton said the force of gravitational attraction is equal to g times m1 m2 divided by r squared. He also said f equals ma. Hope you're writing this down because I'm not going to. We can therefore set ma equal to g times m1 m2 divided by r squared. We can divide the get rid of the, the m's and that would be the little m's, okay? my telephone for instance and you're left with the acceleration of gravity being g times the mass of the earth divided by the square of the distance between my cell phone and the center of the earth that's what it means you really shouldn't misrepresent this stuff this way now at the end of the day the bottom line is this this phone has a weight a mass cavendish said that it's a 50 millionth that represents gravitation and this guy claims that he's measuring acceleration of gravity. Not the weight of the phone accelerating, the gravitational effect on the phone. But almost all of this is going to be to do with the weight of the phone, the mass of the phone. Well, that was extraordinary. Cavendish wasn't measuring little g, Anthony. Cavendish was measuring big g. Cavendish was measuring the universal gravitational constant, not Earth's gravitational acceleration, and you damn well know that. Now look, I observed centripetal acceleration, the dependent variable, in a reference frame normal to the acceleration of gravity. I changed the independent variable, the orientation of that reference frame, and observed the predicted change in centripetal acceleration. That, my friend, confirms a gravitational acceleration unattributable to density, dropity, flurspective, angle of attack, or any other flat earth nonsense. And oh, by the way, I can tie my own shoes. And believe me, if one of those things catches you in the backside, it's going to leave a mark. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. Gladys, we're out of here.